Okay, welcome back. Uh, courageous man or foolish man? Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now, if you saw courageous man, foolish man, uh, Noah, the flood, the wickedness, him not leaving his habitation. We talked about the habitation of a Christian and how wicked the world was and God's wrath was poured out on the world. And, and uh, Noah, his wife, uh, Shem, Ham, and Japheth and their wives got, were the only ones that went into the ark and were saved. And they got to see God's power. So we're going to go to Genesis 9. If you turn to Genesis chapter 9. And that's where we're going to start today. So, verse 18. And the sons of Noah went, in, went forth of the ark. Were Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And Ham is the father of Canaan. Okay. I didn't look into it, but it's, it's interesting that it says Ham is the father of Canaan. It doesn't say that who Shem's the father of or Japheth. It just says Ham's the father of Canaan. So Canaan, you'd have to look into that, what kind of people they are. But I kind of have an idea by what Ham did. Verse 19, These are the three sons of Noah, and of them was the whole earth overspread. And Noah began to be a husbandman, and he planted a vineyard. Now, some people might think uh, husbandmen, you know, a man that's a husband. You know? But let's look it up in Webster's 1828 Dictionary. Husbandman, a farmer, a cultivator or tiller of the ground, one who labors in tillage. Um, also, a husbandman is the master of a family. Now, back then, the whole family lived together. We think of a family as husband, wife, and kids. That's the family. But back then, you had the father and mother and kids, and you had the grandparents, and you had great-grandkids and stuff like that. Everybody lived together. So the eldest in the family, like the oldest man in the family total, uh, was the, ma uh, the husbandman, the master of the family. Okay. Verse 21, And he drank of the wine and was drunken, and he was uncovered within his tent. Now, I've had people say that the atmosphere was different in the flood, and that's how Noah got drunk. Uh, some people say it's because of sorrow Noah got drunk. I, I don't buy that at all. Um, just that the atmosphere was different. Noah trusted God, and Noah believed that God um, is a righteous judge, and that the world deserved what it got. And he was grateful that he got saved, that God saved him. But bottom line, Noah was, I say, sleeping it off in his tent. But another point I want to make is, it doesn't say he drank in the tent, but it doesn't say he didn't either. But for my, what I'm going through and what I believe is, he wasn't so drunk that he couldn't make it back to his tent to lay down and sleep it off. Okay? So he's not like super, super drunk like some people make him out to be. But he drank enough that he went, he laid down, and he passed out and went to sleep. Okay, he was drunk in the tent, like it says here, uh, and he was drunken. Um, verse 22, And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his brethren without. Now, let's stop here for a second. The flood just happened. Ham got to see the destruction that God, the power of God, and he knew how wicked the world was, and yet the moment he steps, not the moment, but it didn't take a long time before he fell flat on his face. So the question is, is when you got saved, God, you got saved, yes. Jesus saved you, God saved you. How many of you, when you first got saved, you went to take your first step and fell flat on your face? That's me. Granted, when I first got saved, I started studying the Bible a lot. And I started getting really into the Word of God. The Bible version issue led me to the true gospel. And I repented. I believed in my heart. And then it was confessed. I confessed it with my mouth, showing I wasn't ashamed of my repentance or belief in the gospel. And I called upon the Lord to save me. But my life was still a mess after I got saved. God had a lot of cleaning up to do in my life. Okay? took almost two years, actually a little bit over two years, before 
God pretty much got a lot of stuff out of my life, but not just that, the temptation where you fall back into it, then God will pull you out, then you fall back into it, then God will pull you out. You know, you have, you're saved, so you truly have sorrow when you fall into sin. Your attitude towards sin is that you hate sin, and you don't want to sin. So you feel like dirt, and you should when you sin. But I fell flat on my face, and I know there's a lot of brothers and sisters out there that will say, yeah, after I got saved, I tried to, I got so excited, I'm saved, and I started <laughs> running to the point of taking my first step, and I fell back on, on my face. Um, you fell into sin, okay? and that's what Ham was doing. I see, I was being stubborn. Um, when it comes to my life, uh, I was being stubborn. I'm just trying to read this for a second. Um, I was so stubborn. And the stubbornness was this. And I see it in a lot of professing Christians. And the reason why they're lost, I believe, is because the changed life, they don't like to change life. They only want to give up sins that they want to give up. And they want to justify sins they want to keep. But with saved sinners, um, the stubbornness is, God says, give up this, and you're like, okay. But this over here relates to this. And you think, uh, my problems was porn, video games, movies, and TV shows. And I knew out of all of them, porn's just the worst thing ever. I need to get it out of my life, so I'm going to quit porn. I'm not going to have anything to do with porn. But I can still keep some of my movies. I can still keep some of my video games and TV shows. And yet, there's porn in all three of those. When there's an immodestly dressed woman that makes you lust after her, it's called porn. I don't care what anybody says. There's porn in all three of those, and because I didn't give up those three things, I fell back into porn. Oh God, why am I keep falling? Because you've got to get all that sin out of your life. And I was stubborn. Well, okay, maybe I can give up... Uh, you know, TV shows and keep movies, or maybe I can keep uh, give up TV shows and movies and keep video games. And there's a lot of sexual themes and video games and everything today. I was stubborn. <laughs> God really had to work with me. Not work with me. He really had to smack me upside the head, basically. Bring me to my knees to help me get all that out of my life. And to this day, the struggle's here. And because I feed the Spirit, I don't know if you remember watching one of my studies where I, a brother in Christ shared this with me about a guy has two dogs and you ask him which one, what dog is the strongest and he said whichever one I feed the most. So a lot of my struggles are up here because I try and choose and do my best to feed my spirit, not my flesh. I am still a sinner. I still fall into sin every now and then, but my biggest struggles today is the temptation. And when you think things, when you first start thinking things and you cut it out and say, Lord, please forgive me, help me get this out, you start singing a hymn, quoting scripture. When you're in town, there's a lot of wickedness in town, and you start quoting scripture and everything, I believe that's just temptation, and that's the struggle you're having with the flesh. But when you give in to those thoughts, and you keep thinking those thoughts, and those thoughts go on, and you find yourself for five, ten minutes thinking things you shouldn't be thinking, that's when you begin, that's when you become, it becomes sin as far as you've fallen into sin and temptation. It doesn't always have to be a physical act. It can be in your head, too, where you're thinking things you're not supposed to. But a brother in Christ quoted this, and I've quoted it before, Luke 9.23, And he said to them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. The encouragement I have for you, brothers and sisters in Christ, is... We're going to fall flat on our face, especially if you're newly saved. Your life is still going to be a mess. It doesn't just become perfect the moment you get saved. And it'll never be perfect. We're going to struggle with the sin till the day we die. But I want to encourage you to understand that it's the struggle that matters. And I told a brother in Christ this um, that told me about how he fell back into temptation. It's the struggle. A true... Bible-believing, God-fearing, born-again Christian is going to struggle with the flesh. And he's going to fight and she's going to fight with all her spirit, with all her heart to not fall into temptation and to get sin out of their life, to make sure their home is a godly home. Okay. But when you do slip up, 
and you fall right back into sin. Now I'm not saying Ham repented, we'll get to that part, but Ham fell back into sin. He fell. He did something he wasn't supposed to. When he looked, I don't know if I'm getting ahead of myself, but he looked. He didn't turn his eyes away and go, oh shoot, Lord, please forgive me. Please forgive me. And let me grab a blanket and let me go in there and cover my father up, his nakedness. He didn't do that. He fell back into sin. But as Christians applying that to us today, when you fall back into sin, that's when you drop your cross. And when you drop your cross, your relationship to the Lord comes to a halt. I'm talking about it doesn't like disappear, but your relationship, think of it as something that's moving. And when you fall into ten, sin and te temptation, it comes to a complete stop. Until you take, repent, forsake, and move on. Until you take that sin to the cross and say, Lord, and you, I always tell you brothers and sisters in Christ, do it ASAP. You don't want the chastening of the Lord. But you drop your cross. Pick your cross. And a brother told me that what that's talking about is when you fall into sin, when you give into sin and temptation, um, you drop your cross. And the Lord knows that we're not going to be perfect. He knows we're going to fail Him sometimes. That's where His love and His grace comes in. But it, does, it still doesn't make it right. But He understands. That's why He told us that you're to pick up your cross daily. You're going to be falling into temptation and sin, whether it's physically falling into it, making a bad decision, or you're having thoughts you shouldn't have. Okay going to happen daily. So don't give in to the temptations, brothers and sisters in Christ, and um, make sure that it's always a struggle. Make sure you're struggling with the flesh, and make sure you're feeding the spirit, not the flesh. 1 Corinthians 10, 13, There hath no temptation taken you, but such is common to man, but God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. And this just goes back to what I'm saying. God knows you're going to be tempted. He knows your flesh is going to tempt you. He knows, and we're going to get there, the lost world's going to tempt you. And yes, He knows that sometimes if you start falling into sin or getting into areas you're not supposed to be, even the devils can whisper in your ear and say, hey, come on, you can do it, or you already did it once, might as well do it again. You can be tempted from all three of those sources. Okay. And sometimes, and this has to be more, more of a study about to, God can tempt you sometimes just to see if you're going to obey Him. And I might be wrong on that, but um, God knows that you'll be tempted. That's why He said that he will not let you be tempted above that ye are able. Bottom line, um, Ham sinned and it was his fault. It was his fault. When you and I fall into sin, it's our fault. We can't say, God, why did you let me be tempted? God, why did you let me fall into sin? Okay. If you remember the uh, courageous man, foolish man, Adam and Eve, you know how Adam, he blamed everybody that was there except himself. You know? You gotta take responsibility for your sin. That's why there's repentance. Repentance is taking responsibility for your failure. You're falling into sin. Okay? Forsaking it is throwing it at the foot of the cross. Get back to feeding the Spirit. Get back in the Word of God. Get back into prayer. And it'll help you forsake it. Where you don't go back to that sin. You'll struggle with it in your head, but you don't go back to that sin. Um, I think I got all that. I talk about my mind um, as an example how uh, my brain, it's just, I filled my head with so much junk as a professing Christian. These faith alone people, you know, it's only believe, it's only believe. Most of my life, I filled my head full of so much junk. And now I'll be talking with the Lord. I'll be in the middle of just talking with the Lord. And I come across one word that reminds me of a movie, a video game, something. And the next thing I know, for the next few minutes, I'm running through that stuff in my head. And I'm like, I just stopped myself and said, Lord, oh my gosh, Lord, please forgive me. And I go back to talking with the Lord. I mean, it's not easy. If, you, if you've been through a lot that I have, and a lot of brothers and sisters out there have been through a lot more than I have, you, you'll agree with me and testify that you've got a lot of junk in your head and you're trying to fill it with the Word. 
And that's where I get to this verse, Psalms 119.9, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. You know what helps with fighting sin? Um, is the word of God. Trying to fill your head with this, God's perfect written word, with this is the most like the greatest thing you can fill your head with and it'll help you get away from all the junk that's filled in your head but even today there's still times that my brain starts wandering is, the, is, a, is a good way to say it and it gets so bad sometimes I'll be in the middle of talking to the Lord and praying with the Lord when I'm sitting out here and my mind just starts wandering just in the middle of it I'll say one word and I'll start thinking of something and and it just distracts me from the Lord. That's what sin does. It distracts you from your walk with the Lord. Um, your flesh, that's the goal of the flesh, is to distract you and take you away from your walk with the Lord. That's the goal of the lost world. That's the goal of Satan and his demons. To, you know, pull you away from your walk with the Lord. But let's get back to Ham. Now notice Ham's reaction. And I talked about this already. Did he cover his eyes? Um, the first glance, like I told you, when you have a thought, that first glance that Ham did, that's the temptation. He could have closed his eyes and said, Lord, forgive me, and, and it would have been just temptation. And he could have grabbed something, covered his father, or asked his brothers to help him cover his father's nakedness. Okay, that was the temptation. How many times, brothers and sisters in Christ, especially with the wicked world, I lo I'm getting to the point where I really don't like going into town itself. I like going to the beaches, and there's times I leave a beach because you get immodestly dressed women on the beach. And you go into town, there's such wickedness and filth all around you. How many times do you do a glance, and then you look away and say, Lord, help me, I don't want to have bad thoughts. Um, whether you happen to... Like, you try to stay with it, away from it, and I tell you to stay away from it as, as a brother that loves the brethren. Uh, cigarettes, alcohol, but how many times that you, people who had problems in those areas, they're walking through the grocery store, and they just happen to barely glance it out of the corner of their eyes, and they turn from it and say, Lord, uh, you know, start singing a hymn, start quoting verses, start talking with the Lord, prayer, saying, Lord, please don't let me think of that stuff. And even when I do it, I still go back to the Lord and say, in my head, I'm like, Lord, please, I'm so sorry for that false professing of faith, that false life I was living, and all the wickedness and sin. He's forgiven me of it. I'm not saying you have to keep asking the Lord to forgive you over and over for the same sin, but when you see that struggle that's the old man, I still sometimes I start getting into prayer and say, Lord, oh my gosh, forgive me, forgive me, forgive me for being that kind of person before you saved me. And how I was stubborn and fought you after I got saved. Yeah. And then you look at these things and you wish you never saw them. And I have a story. Uh, I was with my mom, my dad, and my uncle at a mall. Uh, my mom bought me a really nice uh, jacket, a windbreaker, and it didn't fit. So we had to go back to the store. And I don't... I, I'm one of those people I hate clothes shopping. I go into the stores and they I think they purposely put certain types of clothes mixed in women's with men's to purposely like it's a satanic agenda. And I just hate clothes shopping, you know. I get in, I grab what I need and I get out ASAP. But we went in there, I had to try on some jackets, found one that fit, we bought it, and as I think I was just with my mom and I think it was just my mom I was with, but we started walking to the food court because we were going to have lunch and then I had to start traveling back here from Medford and it's a two and a half hour to three hour drive. And I'm set, as we're walking there, I come across this teenage woman that was dressed so bad that I looked away and I said, Lord, oh my gosh, is it really getting that bad out there? And Lord, you know, help my brain. I don't want to start going places I'm not supposed to and is it really getting that bad? I looked away. Uh, but my mom was talking to me afterwards and said, you know what, that woman was, it was worse than I thought. But thank the Lord, praise the Lord, give him all the glory. I looked away before I saw how bad it was. But it's getting really bad out there. Okay. 
it is getting really, really bad out there. So I can understand there's people that mock people like me saying you're trying to hide from the world. I'm trying to hide from wickedness. I'm trying to hide from temptation. Okay? I still go to town and I drop gospel tracts off everywhere I go. I still sometimes, when God will give me courage, will hand out gospel tracts. And to those who feel like they don't have courage, I'll testify. There's a lot of times I, if you want to use that word chicken out, I lack courage and I'm like, I want to give them a gospel tract, but I fail the Lord. I'm not hiding when it comes to preaching the gospel. And I'm not hiding from the lost world when it comes to, I guess, yeah, preaching the gospel. It's just, I don't want that sin and wickedness in front of me. The Bible says you're to abstain from all appearance of evil. I don't want that wickedness in front of me. And I can see a lot of brothers and sisters in Christ out there saying, I want to buy some land, you know, out in the countryside, mountainside, and I want to just, you know, learn how to provide for myself, you know, grow stuff, and I just only want to deal with the lost world and the wickedness when I go to preach the gospel, when I have to go into town and get things. Um, so it is getting really bad out there. So it goes back to, let's see, let's go back to Ham. Even wish you never saw it to begin with. I already did that one. Okay. No, he went, going back to the first glance, did Ham, when he first looked, did he go, oh, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. Um, let me get something to cover. Did, did Ham do that? No. He went to tell someone else so as to get them to look. How many people out there, brothers and sisters in Christ out there, where you have, it might go be as bad as having a brother and sister in Christ try to tempt you because they're having a problem with the flesh and they get to tempting you to have that same problem. Not intentionally, but it's just that, you know, the lost world does it left and right. A, he held that sin in his heart, because you'll look at what happens next. He didn't, you know, repent or go, oh, I'm so sorry. B, he wanted someone else to share in that sin. Remember, have we gotten to that verse? Yes, where he went to tell his brothers. He wants somebody else to, um, to share in that sin. So how many of you, after you got saved, had family and friends try to succeed into pulling you back into sins? The old man that you've given up for the Lord. Um, I have. Okay. I love my brothers. I do. Um, I have a brother that he does respect my home, and of not wanting to. I tell him I don't want him bringing sins in here into my home, and I really try to push him. I don't want him bringing girlfriends over and everything. But I also have a brother that I feel so bad because at the time that I was a professing Christian but not a possessing one, I was into video games hardcore. And I got my little brother into video games, online games. Um, you have monthly payments and you get to talk with people as you're playing and everything. I got him into online games and he is really addicted to it. And every time I go down to see him, which is rare, down up to, to Washington to see him, I get the video games thrown in my face, wanting to watch movies thrown in my face, and that temptation, um, sometimes I can't handle it. And that's why you don't put yourself into that temptation. But how many times do you get the lost world family members tempting you? I've told people for, like my mom, I love my mom to death, but I told her that I've given up movies, they're wicked, they're sinful, and I don't watch TV shows. I gave them all up. They're wicked. But every once in a while, she'll come back with, hey, there's this great movie coming out. And, well, in this one TV show, this was this funny thing. That and I'm like, Mom, I don't want to hear it. I don't want the temptation. I gave it up for the Lord. Okay. But how many of you have people that want to pull you back in? And there's people out there that are false converts, servants of Satan, that are trying to purposely. It's not just they're lost and they need Jesus Christ, they're purposely trying to pull you back into sin. You'll have a lot of uh, lost people that say, you know, are you holier than thou? You think you're better than me? Well, if we're saved and they're lost, we are supposed to be better than they are. We're supposed to be living a holier life than they are, a changed life after salvation. See, I encourage the brethren to stay in God's word and prayer as often as you can. 
when you have attacks coming in, temptations from your flesh, from the lost world, or from Satan and his demons, and servants, you know, his servants, uh, he can use people to his advantage, lost people. Uh, just stay in God's word and prayer. Um, what do I do when I pray? I talked to people before about this, and this is encouraging, I'm trying to encourage you, that sin is always negative and it's a bad thing. No good thing ever comes from sin. Not at all. Uh, when I pray, there's two types of prayers that I know of, and people can try to th throw more in there if you think, but I'm talking about ways to pray. I can sit out here, and I can just talk with the Lord. Like I'm talking to you, I talk with the Lord. There's people that, when I drive in the car, there's times I'll talk with the Lord as I'm driving. I'm not closing my eyes, I'm just driving. I'll sit out here, I'll walk on the beach with my memory verses, and I'll talk with the Lord, and I'll pray with the Lord that's praying. Any time, a prayer is talking with God. Okay? And the second type of prayer you can have is what's called fervent prayer. That's where you actually are on your knees, leaning against something, and you're like this, and your eyes are closed, and you've got your head bowed because you really, really want to take something to the Lord hardcore and not be distracted by anything, and you want to sit there and pray for a while about something that's really weighing heavy on your heart. Two ways you can pray. Now, if you've watched my video about God will not, why God will not listen to certain prayers, it's because people like to hold iniquity in their heart. Um, so, if you want to go watch that one, it's a. I'm not patting myself on the back. It was God. I was doing my. I did the video where I was singing, showing you guys that you can sing psalms. You don't have to be. Uh, so musically talented, you know, you can just come up with one little tune and you can sing verses uh, from Psalms and sing Psalms to the Lord. And I came across that and I said, Lord, does that mean what I think it means? And why, when, why lost people, why God will hear the prayer of somebody who's in the process of getting saved by the Lord? Now, I'm not talking about works, I'm talking about they come before the cross, they repent and they throw that iniquity that's in their heart at the foot of the cross. That way when they confess both in prayer, showing the Lord they're not ashamed, and they call upon the name of the Lord, He hears them because that iniquity is no longer being held in their heart. And there's times where brothers and sisters in Christ out there, you fall into sin, and life just starts getting miserable, and it's supposed to, and it might get as bad as the Lord chasing you, but even before the Lord chastens you, you're like, Lord, why is my life so, why my life so bad and everything? Um, if you're holding iniquity in your heart, God's not going to hear you. You can pray, Lord, say, you know, help me with this, but as long as you continue in that sin and you try to justify that sin or you just, I know what's wrong, I know what's wrong, and you keep doing it, God's going to get to the point where God's going to chasten you to get it out of your life. Okay. goes back to what I was saying, um, and holding iniquity in your heart is sin. When you're in sin, it hurts your relationship with the Lord. It does, and you need to repent, forsake, and get that sin out. Psalm 66, 18 was what I was singing. Um, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. Ham kept the iniquity in his heart. Okay? He, he thought it was funny. I know it didn't say funny, but I mean, when you see something that's weird or you see something that's funny, the first thing you want to do is share it with somebody. But when you're lost, when you're saved, you realize that some things you used to think was funny, ha, 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 it's not really funny. It's sin, and it's serious. He didn't cover his eyes. He didn't repent. He was not convicted by what he had done. Okay? He went to his brothers saying, Hey, check this out, check this out. Thinking his brothers would have been like, Oh, this is funny, ha, ha, ha. Boy, was he shot, uh, surprised. Or wrong, at least. Yeah, how do we know this? He went and told his brothers. I mean, think about it. After God destroyed the earth with the flood, all this power that God showed and displayed and he told Noah and Noah told his sons this is what's going on, this is what's going to happen and um, the, the wickedness of the world and I might do a study on this but in the New Testament it talks about how knowing is Greek coming to English but and then 
Hebrew to English is Noah. Excuse me. Noe, it says he was a preacher of righteousness. Then there's another one where it says that the people had no clue about the flood, and I'm paraphrasing, until the day that Noah and his family went into the ark. So, like I said, I'm going to do a study on it because we always keep saying that Noah preached that the flood was coming to all the people. See, he was a preacher of righteousness. The flood's coming, you need to repent. You see that in so many stories. From my, what I little, because I have to really look into it, and if you want to look into it, I think that he didn't preach that the flood was coming to the people. The preaching of righteousness is him saying, I'm not going to have anything to do with that. Someone comes up to me and says, hey, let's get drunk. No, that's a sin, and I will not sin against God. Preacher of righteousness. Hey, let's you know, have a big party and do things, you know, sin, sin, sin. No, I'm not going to do that. And he said with his voice, he taught his sons, this is right in God's eyes, this is not right in God's eyes. He was a preacher of righteousness, and the people didn't know about the flood until uh, they entered the ark. Now that also can mean that when the flood was going to actually start, they didn't know. But I believe that Noah taught his kids to be righteous in God's eyes. So Ham knew it was a sin. And after seeing all that destruction, what God did to the world for falling into just wicked, wicked, wicked sin, uh, was it sin continuously on their heart? It was just nothing but sin, sin, sin? Um, and he did it, and he had no fear of God. I mean, there's times where I go, oh Lord, when I cover my eyes, especially going into town, I'm like, oh Lord, please forgive me. There's times where, you know, that we should, and I should do it more often, where you need to fall on your knees and say, Lord, forgive me for looking at that or thinking that. Uh, forgive. You definitely need to do it and repent if you actually fall into the sin. And uh, you got to fear God. Fearing God is not, uh, when I was growing up, they had these t-shirts that said, N-O, fear, no fear, and K-N-O-W, no God. Uh, no, you're to have fear. So that was a lie from Satan when you have a shirt that says, No fear. You're not going to have no fear because you know God. That's not what the verse is talking about. It said, uh, Fear is the beginning of wisdom. You're to fear God. You're to fear that chastening. But you're to be grateful for it after it happens. But you're still to fear God. And the, see, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And the knowledge of the Holy is understanding. When you start to know God, God lets you know things in here. You're not going to understand God completely. Not until we get, we're given the mind of Christ. But God will let you know about Him in here. And as you get to know Him, you start to understand God. He'll give you understanding. But fearing God is where the wisdom comes in. Now, was Shem being courageous when he saw his dad naked and went and told his brothers, Hey, come take a look, take, take a look. Was he being courageous? No. He was a fool. Especially after seeing everything that happened. The flood, the destruction, God killing most everybody except for the Moses and his wife, his three sons and his wife and their wives. He didn't learn from the flood. Let's see, from God's wrath, and he did not fear God. And here's where it hits our heart and pricks us. How many times have we refused to learn from the mistakes of someone else? Okay. Best example is my grandfather, and he would always tell us, you better not do that, you know. And his famous words were, I told you so. And not the number one famous words, but he'd always say this when we fell flat on our face as a, and I was a professing Christian back then, but he'd say and try to warn us his wisdom of his age and his experience in life. He'd say, you don't want to do that. You better not do that. And we would do it. And he'd be like, I told you so. How often do we have to have some, a brother and sister in Christ tell you, I told you so? Uh, how many times have you fallen into sin and you open the book and it's the Holy Spirit and your conscience saying, I told you so. If you saw the video I did on there, how your conscience can bear witness in the Holy Ghost. How many times have you done that? You open it up and it's talking about exactly the sin you're doing. 
And it's like, you've read it before, you knew about it, and you just gave in to the sin. And it's like, I told you so. I told you you're not supposed to do that. I told you that you fall into sin, it's going to hurt your relationship with the Lord. If you live by the flesh, you shall die. Brothers and sisters in Christ, don't let anybody try to fool you into thinking that fearing God is just knowing who He is. That's, that's all fearing God is. It's not. Okay, you're not supposed to live in fear all the time. The fear comes in when you fall into sin. When you get tempted, that fear is to help, is supposed to be a motivator to keep you from sin. Okay, we have the perfect written word is how you fight sin, and the Holy Spirit, uh, by the Holy Spirit through God's perfect written word. But that fear is also supposed to be a motivator not to sin. Okay. Not to give into the world. Be not conformed to this world. Uh, you're not to be a friend of the world. You're staying from all appearance of evil. All these commands, when you're not doing what you're supposed to do, and you start doing what you're not supposed to do, that's when the fear comes in. You're to fear the Lord. Never stop fearing the Lord when it comes to sin. Be courageous. Struggle with sin. Do not fall in the trap of justifying sin like the lost world and most of the professing Christian world. Especially the faith alone crowd. Don't fall into the trap of justifying sin. Don't fall into the trap of, thus saith my preferences, and it's no longer thus saith the Lord. Okay? Be courageous. Cora courageous, if I can say it right. Be courageous. Struggle with the sin. You know, Fight sin through the written word of God and by the Holy Spirit. And don't think... You gotta be courageous when you do fall into sin also. When you fall into sin, you need to be s strong, but more importantly, you need to f go to the foot of the cross. You need to repent. When you fall into sin and temptation, you need to run to the Lord. You need to grab the Bible, start reading after you've repented, told the Lord you're sorry, sorrow in your heart for sinning against God. All right? And you do need to have that courage to do that. Don't just say, well, you know, I already did it once. Might as well do it a few times and enjoy it before I get chased into the Lord. No, you need to have courage, brothers and sisters in Christ. Repent, forsake, and after you do it, don't let it eat at you. If you're truly repenting with sorrow in your heart and you forsake, the moving on part is you get back into the Word of God. The moving on part is you get back into prayer hardcore. The moving on part is you pick up where you left off with your relationship with the Lord and you keep walking. You pick up that cross daily, as we talked about. Verse 23, And Shem and Japheth took a garment and laid it upon both their shoulders, and went backwards and covered the nakedness of their father, and their faces were backward, and they saw not their father's nakedness. Okay. So as you see, um, Shem and Japheth, didn't go over there and start looking too and laughing, this is funny. No, they put a blanket on both their shoulders, they walked back, backwards, and they covered their father's nakedness. They feared God. I believe that they actually feared God. And if you go down the story of Shem, not Sh yeah, Shem, um, Shem feared God. He was a man of God. Okay. They knew it was wrong to look, so they didn't look. Notice also that they covered their father so his nakedness could no longer be seen. Repent, forsake, and move on. Okay. Now Shem and Japheth did not sin, but they did not, but they did do an action to keep them from sinning. This is where it's going to be tough. This is where I'm going to start really hammering it home with the brothers and sisters in Christ out there. I already talked about it a little bit. I was into porn, movies, TV shows, video games. Another way to keep from sinning, the number one way, is the Word of God. And the Word of God tells you to abstain from all appearance of evil. Okay. See, brothers and sisters in Christ, you'll have to forsake things which require a physical action, not just a mental one. So, what did I do? Um, I started giving up movies. I mean, I'd watched, I had like, I keep telling people, I had like over 100 to 300 movies and I had TV show series, and I have watched them so many times after I got saved, I could sit there and pull one up and go, okay, this has a lot of cussing. I didn't have to watch it, a lot of cussing, it goes out. 
this one has partial nudity. This one has sodomite jokes. This one, you know, insinuates fornication. On and on. I could just, you know, stop and start going through it in my head. And that goes back to what I was saying. I filled my head with so much junk. Praise the Lord. He's helping me fill my head with something that I need to have in my head. And that's the Word of God. But you're going to have to do a physical reaction sometimes to keep from that temptation, to keep from that sin. Um, Shem and Japheth covered their father's nakedness. I mean, they could, I mean, think about it. They could have just closed off the tent and said, nobody go into the tent. They didn't want the temptation. They covered their father's nakedness. Right. Uh, things in my house. Uh, see, going through life. Keep going through your life. Uh, communion. A, a sister in Christ asked me to do a video on communion, and I might do it sometime in the future. But basically, communion is not a ceremony. It's not some specific ceremony. You've got to do it a specific way, like the Catholics, with the Eucharist and all that satanic garbage. True communion is about you going over your life. Um, gosh, I'll try to, if I can find it, but there's a verse in Ephesians... I think it's 6, or chapter 6, 5 or 6, where it's talking about the changed life, and it goes to a lot of things that you need to make sure is not in your life. And that's what communion is about. You take bread, and you do a little bit of grape juice. You can do, what is it, cranberry grape, because it's usually a lot cheaper. Grape juice, I'm shocked when I went down to try to grab some grape juice. Uh, just plain grape juice is not always easy to find. Um, that's there in the grocery stores, but you just see like one little section, and it's get, it's pretty expensive. So it, it doesn't have to be grape juice, okay? The whole point is you're sitting there eating the bread and drinking. I'll sit at the table and I'll have a plate of cheese and bread, and um, I'll have a little glass of grape juice or um, cranberry grape, and the whole thing is is you're sitting there and you're thinking and you're reflecting on your life, saying, Lord. I gave all this stuff up. Here's the things I'm still struggling with. Lord, help me with these struggles. Lord, is there anything else in my house? You know, walk in the house and say, Lord, is there anything sinful and wicked in the house still? Is there something that I need to give up because I want my home to be a God godly home? I want God's blessing on my home. You know, I don't want God's chastening on my home. I want God's blessing on my home. So some of the things that God showed me in the past, oh gosh, anywhere between three to six months, is I had a beer stein from my grandfather. It had a train on it. I had it setting up in the, in the kitchen. There's a spot way up top that I had it setting, and I kept walking by it thinking, hey, it's a cool train, something I got from my grandfather and everything. And as I kept walking by, for some reason, the Lord kept putting it on my heart. And every so often I'd do communion, but um, the Lord kept putting it on my heart and said, do you really realize what that is? I said, yeah, it's a, it's a beer stein. And then I froze, and I'm like, yeah, but I'm not supposed to be promoting beer, drinking, going to the pubs to get drunk, you know. And I'm like, it just kept pricking my heart to the point where I threw it out. And I'm like, that's it. That's the last thing. I don't have to give up anything else, okay. And I told the story once about the ashtray that I came across that I got from Thailand, and I thought it was just like a little cup type thing and after looking at it closely a it was an ashtray and b it had false gods on it and i had walked past it a million times in the sense that i always looked at that little cabinet i keep all my uh keepsakes in for my traveling and i just say those are souvenirs i just say they're souvenirs there's nothing wrong with it they're just souvenirs okay and god really put it on my heart pricked my heart and i had to throw it out i I want God's blessing on my home. I don't want sinful, wicked things in my home. And guess what? That's the last thing. It's the last thing I had to throw out. There's nothing else. My home is good. <laughs> no. I found a plate I got from Okinawa. And it had the two dogs on it. That's these two spirits that protect the home. And everything. And it's like, oh, Lord. Broke it. Threw it out. And it had gold. You know, 24 karat gold on it and all that stuff. And I'm like, you know what? I'm throwing it out. Was that the last thing? No. 
uh, I came across, the pr it really convicted my heart, and I will do a video on it, how we're not to make images, period, of the Godhead. We're not to do drawings of God the Father, we're not to do drawings of Jesus Christ, and we're not to do drawings of the Holy Spirit. And we're definitely not supposed to have symbols, the trichetra of the so-called faith alone people that still stand for the Trinity, the trichetra. Uh, you have to have symbols for the Godhead. No images that are before you that you can see. And the biggest reason why is look at this fake Jesus that the Catholic Church promotes. Long hair, you know. Lord, please don't let it rain. I can feel the moisture. We're getting close. But no, I threw out a lot of stuff that had images of Jesus Christ, especially ones that had the feminine Jesus Christ because I collect Bibles and everything. And sometimes I find picture Bibles. Verse 24, And Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done unto him. And he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants shall he be unto his brethren. And that's why I mentioned Canaan up top, Ham, the father of Canaan. And he said, Blessed be the Lord God of Shem, and Canaan shall be his servant. God shall enlarge Japheth, and he shall dwell in the tents of Shem. And Canaan shall be his servant. And Noah lived after the flood three hundred and fifty years and all the days of Noah were 950 years, and he died. i got to throw in there a second. God will forgive you of your sins, but sometimes your sins will still have physical repercussions in this life. Before we get our um, incorruptible bodies um, and the mind of Christ, what you do here is sometimes you're going to have to suffer for it. And I'm not saying like the Catholic Church. I'm saying if you're an alcoholic and you get saved and through the grace of God and I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me and he gets out of your life you might still have some physical uh, problems because of that life of out being an alcoholic because of that life with drugs with cigarettes uh, people who were fornicators you know uh, you can have all kinds of diseases because of that uh, financial trouble just because you get saved oh, God how come I'm still in financial trouble making bad decisions the Bible says if you live by the flesh you shall die for if you live after the flesh you shall die but if you through the spirit do mortify the deeds of the body you shall live that goes back to hating sin and trying to get sin out of your life 1 Corinthians 11:32. but when we are judged we are chastened of the Lord that we should not condemn be condemned with the world. Um, Ham was punished. I mean, Noah basically cursed him. Okay? There are times where it gets so bad in our life that we're not listening to God that He's going to chasten us. And it's going to be bad. You know, it's, it's, you're going to be suffering. And it's not God's fault, it's your fault. Uh, when you fall into sin and temptation and your lost life of sin, Remember the study I did about conscience, how you have the laws of God written on your heart as a lost man. You're the one to blame. 2 Corinthians 6, 9, As unknown and yet well known, as dying, and behold we live, as chastened and not killed. God will not kill you and take you home early if, unless the chastening is not working. Okay. For whom the Lord, let's see, Hebrews 12, 6 and 7, For whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth, and scourgeth every son whom he received. If ye endure, endure chastening, God dealeth with you as with sons. For what son is he whom the father chasteneth not? And I understand Hebrews is written to Hebrews in the time of Jacob's trouble, but there it talks about he loves us as a father would a child. That's why he chastens us. Now, in summary, Ham was foolish, but Shem and Japheth were courageous. Make sure that you're struggling with sin, you don't justify it. Make sure that you're staying in the Word of God. Make sure you're staying in prayer. And you're allowing the body of Christ to encourage you. That's what I'm trying to do for you, brothers and sisters of Christ. I'm trying to encourage you to stay away from sin. I'm trying to encourage you not to resurrect the old man. I'm trying to encourage you that when you do fall into sin and temptation, take it to the Lord ASAP. Okay? Don't be foolish. Don't be one of those people that has to learn the hard way. Um, I've been a fool. Okay, you can still be saved and be a fool and fall flat on your face. Okay, don't learn the hard way. You don't want God's chastening. After it happens, it's a blessing to get you back on the right path. But you should never seek the chastening of the Lord. Okay.
the don't fall into the trap of not fearing God. Don't let people try to twist it and everything and make it, you know, feeling, fearing God is just knowing God, you know, knowing who He is, you know. Uh, no. Uh, fearing God is fearing God. Uh, Ham saw the destruction that God did on the wicked people, okay. He knew the destruction, the power of God, yet he didn't fear God. He looked and laughed and thought it was funny. No fear whatsoever. Okay. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. See, Proverbs 1.17, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Remember, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Okay. And the knowledge of the holy is understanding. So here it says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. So, could have been off on that a little bit. But knowledge, um, but it also says wisdom. Okay, it's a good thing to fear the Lord. Okay. Proverbs 9.10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. There's the one. And the knowledge of the holy is understanding. Okay, knowledge of the holy is understanding. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Fearing the Lord, um, will start. you'll start knowing the Lord when you fear Him. God says that you're to study to show thy I see, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be shamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. I fear the Lord, I'm going to stay in the word. Okay? Uh, there's a perfect written word of God today. Uh, it's the King James Bible, been proven time and time again. I'm not going to promote Bible perversions because I fear the Lord. Mm -hmm. Ham did not fear God and justified his sin. How, why do we know that? Because he went straight to his two brothers. Uh, Shem, uh, Shem and Japheth, saying, thinking they'd just be thinking it's funny too. And he tries to get his brothers full. So remember, you're going to get temptation from the lost world, from lost family members. And yes, it, believe it or not, it can happen to get, you get temptation from a brother or sister in Christ. Um, try not to be someone who tempts a brother and sister in Christ and do your best not to fall into that temptation. Get it out of your life. I know you probably love family members, but if you go to a family member's home to visit, and every time you go there, you've got all this temptation in your face, and you tend to give in to that temptation, then you don't go to that family member's home. I'm sorry. That's what, What's more important, your walk with the Lord or going to visit that family member? What's more important, having God's grace and blessing on you or His chastening, you know? Something putting a wall between you, getting into sin. Uh, so, just want to encourage the, the brethren. Ham was foolish. Shem and Japheth were courageous. Be courageous. Do your best not to fall into sin. Be courageous. Take it to the cross. Repent, forsake, and move on. Okay? Be courageous. Stay away from sin. The temptation of sin. Stay away from it. And I always keep going back to this over and over, and I'll continue to go back to this over and over. Make sure your home is a godly home. You should, you should always be walking the house. At least, I'm not saying there's a specific time, but I, you know, once a month, I'll throw it there, minimum. Once a month, you know, you should at least be walking the house and t and you pray and you talk with the Lord as you're walking through the house and saying I, I love this stuff this is fine that's fine it's good and the Lord will show you okay wait a minute you get a bad feeling about this here or a bad feeling about that or something will be so obvious you look at it when you're praying with the Lord and you're walking through the house you're like how come I didn't see that before have courage to say, Lord, I'm sorry that's in my house, and have the courage to take it, destroy it, and throw it in the garbage. Okay. Be courageous, brothers and sisters in Christ. I love you. I'm praying for you. Pray for the body of Christ. And I'll see you in the next video.